Welcome, dear readers. You are listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast. We are recording in the intimate Carol Shields Auditorium in the wonderful Millennium Library here in Treaty 1 Territory, and on land that is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Today we will be discussing The Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman. I'm Alan Chorney, the branch head librarian at the Transcona Library, and across the table from me is... Hi, everyone. My name's Kirsten, and I'm the librarian at the West End Library. And joining us from across the ocean at the end of some lane, probably, is... Hi, everyone. I'm Erica Ball, branch head at Fort Gary Library, and currently across the pond in England. A good book can carry me away from an ever-engine ordinary we couldn't do this without you dear readers and we want to harness the power of the hive mind of the internet to start off our discussions so email us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca remember only you can determine whether we laugh or cry there will be spoilers so each month be sure to find time to read the selected book so you can find time to read on itunes stitcher or your favorite podcast service we want to talk to you about what you want to talk about, so send your thoughts and comments anytime to wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca or find us on social media, and we'll incorporate your comments on the air. Make sure you stick around to the end for our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. But first, Kirsten is going to tell us everything we wanted to know about the life of Neil Gaiman, followed by Erica, who will spoil everything with a brief synopsis. So if you haven't read The Ocean at the End of the Lane and you would like us to wait, Press pause now. All right. So biography of Neil Gaiman. He's so popular. He's so well known. But here goes. Neil Gaiman was born 1960 in England and is a writer of short fiction, novels, audio theater, films, graphic novels, and comics. And in fact, is credited with being one of the creators of modern comics. He writes for both children and adults. He was able to read at the age of four and describes himself as a feral child who was raised in libraries. The first book he wrote was a Duran Duran biography, and his second was a biography of Douglas Adams called Don't Panic, The Official Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Companion. He began writing comics in the mid-1980s, including his popular The Sandman series, which concluded in 1996. His work in comics and graphic novels, however, continues. He's also the author of other well-known works like Caroline, The Graveyard Book, and American Gods, which was recently developed into a series for television. Gaiman is very active on social media and has developed a rather loyal and cult-like following. It is said that he was one of the first writers to have a blog. He started it way back in February 2001. And his website is really a bit of a treat, so um, check it out. We'll have the uh, website in our show notes. He keeps bees on his property in Minnesota. He really likes to make omelets and has said to have a talking cat. Neil Gaiman believes that we all, adults and children, writers and readers, have an obligation to daydream and that we have an obligation to imagine and to make things beautiful. In 2013, Ocean at the End of the Lane was voted Book of the Year at the British National Book Awards. Okay, so credit where credit is due. This is adapted from the Goodreads blurb. Sussex, England. A middle-aged man returns to his childhood home to attend a funeral. Although the house he lived in is long gone, he is drawn to the farm at the end of the road where, when he was seven, he encountered a most remarkable family, 11-year-old Letty Hemstock and her mother and grandmother. He hasn't thought of Letty in decades, and yet as he sits by the pond, a pond that she claimed was an ocean, behind the ramshackle old farmhouse, the unremembered past comes flooding back. And it is a past too strange, too frightening, too dangerous to have happened to anyone, let alone a small boy. This is the story of the hidden powers of the universe and what happens when they are let loose in the world. Unremembered past. I like that. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. We'll definitely check in with you uh, in a little while, see how things are across the ocean. <laughs> okay, so from your biography, Kirsten. Yes. Uh, just, just off topic briefly do you have any feral children who live in your library (laughs) 
There are a few, <laughs> and I love them all. <laughs> okay. uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is the cult of Neil Gaiman, and mm. um, hopefully we don't offend any of the cult members out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but this is the first Neil Gaiman book I've read, and me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's good, and I, I feel like Neil Gaiman is someone that I should like on paper. Like, <laughs> I'm into fantasy, and he's like the epitome of nerd culture. He's, as you said, the savior of, of graphic novels, which I'm really into. <laughs> but he, he just, for whatever reason. I haven't been hooked by him, hmm. by by anything. And I don't think this book included, not that there's anything wrong with right. this book, but um, what, what are your thoughts? Well, it, it's interesting because I've actually never read a Neil Gaiman book either, um, aside from uh, some short stories, uh, some of his sort of kind of fairy poetry I've read. I like this book. I It's mm -hmm. nice and short. Uh, I think I've already said I'm a bit of a fan of magic realism, not necessarily a fan of fantasy. I don't know if I can explain what the difference is, but uh, but I, I did enjoy it. It's kind of interesting that the two of us are here and we're talking about the book with Erica from Across the Pond, and neither of us are huge, huge Neil Gaiman fans, but uh, but I liked it. I think maybe I liked it a little bit more than you, perhaps. Yeah, probably a little <laughs> bit more than me, it sounds like. Uh, I didn't unenjoy it, or yeah. did not enjoy it, I, I, but I'm not going to be shouting from the rooftops uh, about it. Um, but I... I feel like it's going to be one of those things where someday I'm just going to be on a bus late at night reading, come across a Neil Gaiman book on my Kobo and just get like drawn in Immersed. and be like, that That will be it. I'll be like, Neil Gaiman, accept me into your call. <laughs> I, I, would, I would love to have him over for dinner too. I had said that about Colson Whitehead last month, but I, I really mean it about Neil Gaiman too. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. He just sounds like a fascinating, interesting... Friend, and he lives friendly in, guy in Minnesota, so it's not too Partly, far. Partly, yeah, <laughs> so it's not far. Neil, Neil Gaiman, himself if you're listening <laughs> and ever need a need a dinner in Winnipeg. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Kirsten's place. <laughs> um, so one of the questions we asked on social media was, why doesn't the main character have a name, and what would you name him? So we did have one of our listeners uh, write in, Andrea from Henderson Library, uh, wrote in. She said. I don't think he needs a name. Heck, until now, I didn't realize he didn't have one. Through the narrator, we are all able to live in this magical world, if only for a little while. So I have to agree with Andrea. Um, I totally didn't notice that he didn't have a name until until you mentioned that, Kirsten. Um, <laughs> so uh, what are your thoughts on the fact that he doesn't have a name? Well, and it's interesting because um, you brought up too earlier that Lots of other people in Neil Gaiman land are very, very concerned about this, and it's a big topic of conversation. I guess I sort of assumed the narrator was maybe Neil. The eye in the story is a pretty strong personal eye. And so, um, and the, the more I started to also get to know Neil Gaiman, I also thought that there there were a lot of similarities. He talks about the boy narrator learning a lot of things about the world um, and about life and how to do things through books, through reading. And he said th something like, if a boy, if he read about a boy climbing a tree, he would then learn how to climb a tree. If, if he read about a boy um, climbing a, a drain pipe, he would learn how to do that. And actually on the back of the book, of our copy anyway, there is a a photograph of a little boy perched on top of a drain pipe, and that is a photo of Neil Gaiman. Oh, whoa. Yes. So <laughs> that all kind of contributed I, to my, um, yeah, my thoughts. I, I was, yeah, I was going to be like, yeah, I noticed the boy on the top of the drain pipe. I didn't, had no idea that was actually Neil Gaiman. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't see his head, but uh, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty wow. cute knees. But I, I don't think it's all that important either for the for the narrator to have a to have a name. Did you notice right away though? Like, is that something you picked up on? I don't think so. Although I think when the dad um, started to call him Handsome George or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah. Then I thought, oh, is his name George or is that just a 
British nickname that fathers use with their sons. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Did you look into that? Did you figure out what handsome George no. is? No. I, yeah. I meant to, and I totally forgot. So. Actually, you know what? Right before we got here, I Googled um, <laughs> handsome George, and I think there were like lots of pictures of, I don't know, is there somebody from One Direction named George? There oh, seem to be a lot of pictures maybe. of s- some British pop star or something. Yeah, I, th- anyway. I think there was a wrestler or boxer or something <gasps> oh, yes, named Gorgeous George. Too. Gorgeous George, George yes, uh, yes. as well. <laughs> uh, but uh, listeners, if you know if uh, there's any any significance to the term handsome George, make sure you write in to us at WPL Dash Podcast at Winnipeg CA and, and tell us the the real story behind it. <laughs> So moving into the meat of the book. So the narrator is a pretty, pretty insulated character, doesn't have a lot of friends, uh, not particularly courageous. Um, so why at does... At the beginning. At the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so why does, and why does Letty decide to protect the narrator? I mean, I, I, it seems to me that in this book, the children were protecting children, you know? And... <laughs> And I think I've talked about this before, too, when we've sort of talked about other books, recorded and not recorded, that that was always sort of a fantasy of mine when I was a kid and all the games that we would play. It was about children taking care of each other. Like our favorite game to play was being orphans. And so the children had to take care of each other. So and I don't think that I'm unique in that. So it's almost like Neil Gaiman just knows adults are reading this story but it's also the story of our childhood so we can relate to that idea that yeah letty would take care of this boy because children take care of children i I want to tie this into another another question uh that we talked about about this being a book uh that's written for adults or at least it's classified in the adult section but one of the major um, requirements of a young adult book is that it is it has a, a child or a youth as a protagonist, uh, which this book does. So there's a lot of, well, this could bu- book could easily be a young adult novel. Do you think it could be a young adult novel? I think it could. Sure. I think it could be a mature child's novel too. <laughs> yeah. It's like a, a fairy tale and fairy tales could be read by all ages. I, I have a confession to make. I, I I don't really buy the idea of why literature being a thing. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think it's a, it's definitely not a genre. I, th- I think there has to be a better, a more accurate word to describe that. Because, you know, you were talking about children protect, pr- protecting children. And I feel like when I was a kid, I never had that idea that I was a child or I don't remember having that idea as a Mm. child I just remember being more mature for my age maybe um you know my my parents can can (laughs) can dispute dispute that that. (laughs) um but I never remember feeling like I was a child or relating to books or stories or games with children in them specifically because they were children I read a lot as a kid and my mom had this huge library and I would just pick books on and I think to this day whatever book I pick that you know I can get right into the voice of the narrator the protagonist or the characters Uh, and same thing with reading books with young adults as, as characters I think it ties back to the name thing where I just forget that they're young adults. I'm just like, yep, that's me. I'm transported into this world. Right. So, so that's actually me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. But not me as a child. It's just no. me. Yeah. It's, yeah. So, well, I mean that, and that comes down to, uh, back to, uh, something that Letty said at some point, I have it marked on my book where she talks about growing ups mm-hmm. and, uh, she talks about, um, uh, I'm going to tell you something important. Grown-ups don't look like grown-ups on the inside either. Outside, they're big and thoughtless, and they always know what they're doing. Inside, they look just like they always have, like they did when they were your age. The truth is there aren't any grown-ups, not one in the whole wide world. I will agree with that. I <laughs> have no idea what I'm doing most of the time. I know. I, know. <laughs> I just pretend all, all the time. I think we all do. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and so I think that's why... Uh, too, I, I mean, I, I sort of agree with you about mm-hmm. the young adult sort of mm-hmm. designation because, I mean, lots of people read y- young adult 
uh, books. Yeah. And I think it's because, yeah, if it's a good story, it's a good story. And you can place yourself in it because inside you're a six-year-old child or you're a 17-year-old young adult or you're a 70-year-old woman. I, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. And, and actually Neil Gaiman also said he was – Something I read that he had said, um, he said that for a long time, like adults still want to read stories. Mm -hmm. And for a while there, there were lots of adult literature being written that didn't really focus on the story. Yeah. And so then, you know, and then that, that's when sort of these series like Harry Potter and, and Hunger Games and, and Mm -hmm. came out. And so more and more adults were reading these young adult series or children's Mm -hmm. series because they wanted that story. So I thought that yeah, was interesting. I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that in, in that stories are important for everybody and not just children. In fact, there's the, um, it's a common misconception that fairy tales were written for children, yeah. but they were, of course, just stories that people shared, old old folk tales and and. You and know, some of them super gruesome, super gory, yeah. just like, you know, death and blood and yeah. all that stuff everywhere. So, um, yeah, I found a quote from uh, from the from the Guardian, their review of the ocean at the end of the lane. They say fairy tales, of of course, were not invented for children and deal uh, ferociously with with the grim, the bad and the dangerous, which which always gets me thinking on. So if fairy tales weren't written for children, is there something that is specifically written for children? Like, is there a type of story that is just for children? Which which brings me back to this whole, I don't think there's any sort of YA <laughs> thing, or at least not right. in the concept of a story. Like, I can understand when you're learning to read, you need simpler mm. grammar, grammar, simpler sentence structure, uh, that sort of thing. But, you know, I think that when children are reading, they just, they want as much depth as, as, as adults do, or, you know, maybe even more so in, in that they're trying to discover their way in the world. Well, and there are a lot of picture books now that are being written with like the the parents in mind too, because they know Mm -hmm. that the parents are going to have to read it 8,000 times. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of times there's like little little details um, that really appeal to to the parent to the adult who's reading it aloud. Yeah, yeah. I wonder when exactly that trend started because I, I remember it in the movies first, like with with movies like Shrek that are like kids movies, but just have this whole right. other subtext of of levels of, yeah. on it. Yeah, and then there's also some one of my one of my favorite board books is. Um, yeah, I have favorite board books. <laughs> um, there was a board book of War and Peace with like that's just like six pages long with uh, that retells the story of War and Peace with little felt characters and very very simple, <laughs> you know, one or two word lines on each page. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With spring comes cleaning. Or so I hear. I've never really felt that pull myself. However, if with the arrival of warmer days, blooming crocuses and budding leaves, you also find yourself cleaning out cupboards and closets, listen up. Please consider donating any literary leftovers, we mean books, to our big book drive happening now until May 11th. The book drive is in support of incarcerated Manitobans and their families, and while some of the books collected will go to prison libraries in Manitoba, others will be sold at a giant book sale on Saturday, June 2nd at the Daniel McIntyre St. Matthews Community Association. All proceeds go to the Manitoba Library Association, Prison Libraries Committee, and the Bar None Prison Rideshare Program. This is a program that provides free transportation to folks visiting friends and family members in Manitoba jails and prisons. Drop-off locations include right here during library hours at the Millennium Library Security Desk. And like I said, we will be collecting books until May 11th. A poster and detailed information will be posted to our show notes. A book drive to help our community members inside Manitoba jails and prisons? Now that's some spring cleaning I can get behind. Moving more into... Was there anything that you wanted to bring up about this story, Kirsten, that that really caught your interest? 
about the actual story. <gasps> yeah, I well, mean, any, I, anything like, in the book. Yeah, that... I mean, I, I did find, uh, I think I, I, I noticed uh, one of our readers saying that um, they just kind of lost themselves in the story. They didn't even think about their own childhood, you know, because yeah. I think we were, um, one of the questions was about... Um, it's partly about memories and, and childhood, this book. And uh, so did it, it evoke some of memories of your own childhood or of being a child? And, and one of our, our readers said, no, it's just, they were just so immersed in the book and the story. Um, for me, I found I was really, um, it, it was like the, I, I had my own childhood memories that were sort of flooded back, you know, because I think I maybe reflected upon what I was reading. And then I thought, oh, yeah, well, I remember when I was four and um, driving through that huge forest fire and the flames were all around the car and I was crying and it was so scary. And uh, years later, my dad showed us a picture of that forest fire and it was miles and miles away. There was like a little (laughs) bit of smoke. But in my memory, we were in the midst of it and it was terrifying. I have similar memories of like being chased by bears too on camping trips, but that didn't really happen that way. So, so I just found I was like, do you tell the stories like they happen? Of course I do. Do you still tell the stories? (laughs) Of course I do. (laughs) (laughs) My parents were such terrible parents. They drove me through forest fires and let me be chased by bears. That's why my dad is like, here's photographic evidence that I did not do that. (laughs) But the story, the story is still, is still there. So yeah. So for me, I, I did really, I related to, yeah, the, the, the whole the evoking of, of of childhood memories and and what does that actually mean like and, and do we build up some of these memories and 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 do we believe in the magic in childhood to help cope through some of the really difficult times like is that what was happening for the narrator like yeah that's a that's a really i yeah i think i was disappointed with the book when I got to the end uh, in the fact that the narrator, once it shifts back to the to the framing of the book and he's an adult again and he's talking to... to oh, The old? The old. H- H- Hemperstock? Hemperstock, yeah. yes, thank you. Uh, and then, you know, she you can tell she's kind of stitching his memory of this event away and, and making him forget it. And then he loses that memory uh, of, of the whole story that he just told and i'm like well that's a waste like what what is the whole point of this and then i and then it clicked for me and i was like oh this is the story is in a lot of ways about him dealing with the affair that his father had with his nanny and he created this whole magical world around it and and to me that's like the only way that this this story makes sense um the way you're looking at me right now makes me think no no i mean i i partially agree but i almost feel like what he was trying to sort of cope with and deal with wasn't actually the affair because i don't think it really kind of that didn't make sense to him. He didn't really understand that they were having sex. Like, I think they were just like, he, he just didn't understand what was going on. He knew it wasn't anything yeah. good. But, yeah. but I felt like what he was really trying to cope with and deal with was death. Like, and I mean, th- this yeah. book starts with the, the man coming back yeah. for a funeral. Okay. And then when the child was small, like it yeah. starts with the death of his kitten. Mm-hmm. And then that suicide mm-hmm. of the opal miner. Yeah. Like there was just a lot of death for him to sort of handle and deal with. And I, I don't know, okay. maybe like the, maybe the death of his parents' marriage. I, I'm not yeah. sure. But so, so death seemed to really... And then, and then by the end, <laughs> he almost had this like understanding about death. Like, yes, I will die. I might yeah. die tonight. Mm-hmm. And he's seven. I might die tonight. And yeah. then he then he even took it even a bit further. Well, I might have to sacrifice my life for for Letty. So yeah. he sort of, did, you know, through this whole mm-hmm. experience, he mm-hmm. kind of, uh, yeah, went comes to, a, to terms with. Well, yeah, hugely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he figured out the whole of the world and life and the universe and existence. When in his in his ride in the bucket in the bucket in the ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was one of the scenes that stuck out with me. I really, I think, was probably one of my favorites, where where Letty carries the bucket over to him because he's trapped in the fairy circle, uh, and she needs to bring him back to her property to be safe. Um, so yeah, and then he steps in the bucket and uh, holds her hand and 
of course, this time he doesn't let go while she carry. I can just he, Neil Gaiman doesn't describe it, but you can just imagine Letty, you know, having this hand in this bucket while she's like toddling back down down to to her. Yeah, there was a lot of great imagery. I think that was created you know right. written yeah he's, he's, he's really great at sort of creating these, vi- these yeah visual forcing i think forcing scenes. the reader to do the work uh, mm-hmm. so i will definitely give him credit for that that was <laughs> that was great don't be a lazy reader <laughs> no do do the work yeah yeah so yeah well and letty was an interesting character hey i mean i know we talked about like why does she protect him um but um it's also she and the other hemper stocks, hemp stock women. Hemp, yeah. It's very interesting. Very... Yeah. Do you want to talk about them? Yeah. I, I feel like you have some thoughts. On, well, no, I yeah. just like, yeah. I just love the maiden mother crone kind of, um, yeah. Sort of Did you get the symbolism feeling or... that they were the same person? Well, I mean, that's maiden mother crone, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. And guess what? I actually have a tattoo of yeah. maiden mother crone. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's the same person, three phases of the moon, right? Yeah. Also. So, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the moon plays in. Uh, yes. Right at the yeah, end, right. Two, I mean, throughout, throughout but yeah, book. right at the end. Yeah. As well. Yeah. So you really are part of the cult if you've, you know, got the tattoo. In, <laughs> I didn't get the game. tattoo because of the <laughs> book. <laughs> <sighs> but yeah, it was, I, I mean, I, I liked uh, how, um, how women were really central to this boy's universe, you know? Yeah. yeah. Both yeah. good and bad. Yes. Oh, yeah. Like right. there right. was, there was the narrator and his father and I guess the, the minor at the beginning who commits suicide. So he's not there. Mm-hmm. And then that's pretty much all for male characters and everyone else is yeah because even the men in the hemp stock women's life yeah they weren't really all that needed they weren't even needed they were needed to create more boys <laughs> right. but they didn't, weren't yeah. even needed to create yeah, more women they, like they, more girls yeah which is which is interesting <laughs> i didn't think too much about that but i was <laughs> i was like sure uh they they create asexually how you know but it really doesn't. That's we not the point, really need right? To know that's that. that's yeah. the point, right? It re- it really doesn't matter there. So um, probably the ocean or the pond is somehow involved. You know, it being yeah. the keeper of life. The, yeah, yeah, so. giver of life. The, yeah. <laughs> what did you think of Ursula as a as a character? Super complex, eh? Because there's like a lot of depth there with the fact that what she wants to do is give people what they want. Yeah, like you sort of at first think, oh, she's a good character, but wait a minute, she's evil. She's evil in this story. Right. But it's almost like she's just she's just so n- new to it that she doesn't really know how to be one of these. Well, because she's a flea, right? That's what um, old uh, hemp stock yeah grandma granny i'm I'm gonna put a check on flea because that's one of the things i want to talk about but it's it's almost like and i just thought of this now it's almost like ursula is the child because she wants to give people what they want but kind of Mm. like in an immediate fashion you know right away and you know children are like i want this now i want this and very black and white like yeah they they need money let's give them money yeah and that's not how it works yeah exactly and you know so as as a child you need to develop these skills to to learn i guess learn about the future and and be like okay i don't need everything right now or everything that feels good now might not be good in a few in in the future so like when the narrator has literally money shoved down his throat well yeah really that's <laughs> choking not a it. good place to place to have money well and then she sort of very much like a child like you were just mm-hmm. saying she just gets angry if you don't like what she's just done right you know yeah. and and i mean unlike a child she gets super super nasty and um well i, I feel like children can get super super well nasty. i just didn't want to say yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they don't have um, they don't have supernatural powers to to fly through the air and hunt you down. But right, but, yeah, yes, yes, and control actions of certain people around you. 
yeah manipulate manipulate yeah 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 but um but going back to the fact Mm -hmm. uh, so we just talked about about how how great neil gaiman can can do things uh with structure i think one of the things that that bothered me is that the the hemstocks always refer to ursula as a as a flea and at the beginning and that really threw me the first time that i read it because i was like is she a flea or a worm because at the beginning of the right. book she worms herself into the narrator's foot and uh he has to you know take a bath and remove her try to remove try to her. remove her yeah. and and almost successfully does so to me she was like a worm and then the hemstocks refer to her as a flea later on and i'm like why don't you just refer to her as a worm the whole way and i don't know why that bothered me so much but i was like it would make so much more sense if she was just always a worm instead of a worm and a flea right well that was just uh granny or what was the the older hemstock she kept calling old miss hemstock yeah calling her a a a flea but i guess the worm also like the wormhole is like also like wormholes into different reality right i mean into space yeah like folding space and cutting through Yeah. yeah But in but in Hempstock Hempstock's world, this this was just a flea, just a like right, yeah, simple, stupid, makes mistakes, yeah, you know. not even worth, mm-hmm. yeah. Although it proved a little bit more difficult to get rid of than maybe well, they thought. Well, if you've ever had fleas, there. <laughs> well, okay, then there maybe not. <laughs> what did you think about um, the fact that the adult narrator sometimes? jumped in and commented i mean very very rarely it was it only happened a few times i probably would have liked more of that yeah i okay. think i really was yeah reading the prologue i was i was interested in him coming back to his his childhood home and i think there was a point of disappointment for me when i realized that that wasn't going to happen that we weren't going to get like con- concurrent stories of his childhood and his current day it was just all this big flashback to the to the past well and this was first written just to be a short story i think right. so yeah. perhaps maybe some of that was added as it was as it sort of grew into more of a novella or I guess it's longer than a novella, but yeah. Yeah. Short, yeah. short yeah, novel. Short novel. It is yeah. pretty short. Yeah. 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 It would be interesting to see his like original notes or story plan or to figure out what kind of writer he is. Cause some writers, you know, have the whole outline planned out before they write the book. And then some writers just like, just start writing and keep writing. And the way he, talks about it kind of makes me assume makes me think that he's the latter and just you know kept going and and that sort of thing then the story just kind of yeah went away with him yeah but it's almost like the um you know when you talk about unreliable narrators we often talk about that um it almost feels like the adult narrator was almost more unreliable than like i'm i'm more likely to believe the child you know what happened that all this, skeptical. all this stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm like, well, because I, I think for me, I had to convince myself that none of the childhood stuff happened for me to make sense of the story. But I feel like you're the opposite in that you were like <laughs> the the whole childhood thing is very obviously the the meat of the because it was real book. for him, right? right? So yeah. I believe it was real, you know. So whether the canvas was that he saw flapping in the wind was actually yeah. Ursula or was just a piece of canvas <laughs> flapping in the wind on a on a, on a tree um, but what he saw yeah. what his reality yeah I totally bought it so this total really relative view of of the world which is something that I often have trouble with is 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 relative views of, of things I'm very like there is one world and it is very objective and this is how things are so that Things like that are are often a problem for me, but I feel like you're kind of different in that sense. (laughs) Well, I I, I think, um, like, I grew up with a lot of, like, a lot of sisters, three sisters, so there were four of us. And so in terms of, like, our realities growing up, 
uh, they were different because our memories are different and how we saw things were different. Do you ever compare memories of events? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Like, I I think I was maybe 13 when I realized that my mother hadn't um, written You Are My Sunshine for me. (laughs) (laughs) Like... (laughs) <laughs> and and then meanwhile my other sister was like yeah. no 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 she had written it for me uh yeah. but and there are like yeah or the, the fire the forest fire memory you know yeah. there are lots of yeah usually oh, wow. we yeah. have i mean i have one sister who says she can't remember anything at all but uh so she relies on us to sort of fill in the blanks so uh, so the you are my sunshine the you are my sunshine my, my only sunshine yeah yeah i hated that song oh my gosh <laughs> it's so so creepy <laughs> I loved it, and my mother wrote it for me. <laughs> Did your mom ever read you that uh, that Robert Munch book? Um, love that, you forever. Yeah, love you forever. No, I am too old for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my mom tried to read that book to me. Well, I'm sure she did several times. And then at a certain point, I was like, this book is way too creepy. Yeah, yeah. It... So for those of you who haven't read this Robert Munch <laughs> book, it's all about this mother who sneaks into her child's bedroom uh, when he's a baby and holds him and loves him and stuff. But she keeps... That's not creepy. That's not creepy. <laughs> but she does it, you know, when he's like eight, still not that creepy. When he's like 16 pretty creepy (laughs) when he's like 20 pretty creepy you know when he's like middle age pretty creepy and then when the mother is old then spoiler alert the son uh goes into her room and holds her like uh he did which which, is so beautiful it it, it come on gives me the heebie-jeebies a little bit Okay, everyone, no you, you <laughs> write in to us and let, let us know what you thought about Love You Forever. We're going to have a whole podcast on Love You Forever <laughs> based on the mail that we, we get in for this. Are you a fan of movies and documentaries? With your Winnipeg Public Library card, you can get access to Canopy, a streaming video service with over 30,000 titles in its collection, including the top 50 titles of the Criterion Collection of Films, The Great Courses, and much more. Whether you're just looking for a great movie to watch to relax, are learning about film studies, or are interested in learning more about the world through documentaries or college-level courses, Canopy has something for you. With Canopy, you can borrow up to five Canopy items per month and play items as often as you'd like within a three-day loan period. Canopy has a collection for children, too, called Canopy Kids. Canopy Kids highlights films and TV series that help children develop empathy, mindfulness, and self-esteem through entertaining and educational videos. To ensure parents have clear guidelines on which films are age-appropriate, they've integrated common-sense media ratings on their kids' videos. As if that wasn't enough, all videos on Canopy, including the new Canopy Kids collection, also come with public performance rights. Viewing films in a group forum is permitted as long as the viewing is by authorized viewers, that is, WPL card holders, and it is not for commercial benefit, i.e. no admission costs are charged and no profit is made from the screening. Visit our website, winnipeg.ca slash library. Click on the ebook slash digital content button, then click on the e-movies and TV help button on the left side of the screen. There you'll find information about getting started with Canopy, including steps to get Canopy streaming to your TV. Enjoy! But, burnt toast. Oh! Do you remember the burnt toast? Yeah! Can you tell us about the burnt toast? So, uh, the narrator uh, always thought that his dad loved eating burnt toast because he always just made burnt toast yeah and he always ate it and he always seemed to love it and the the boy hated it of course Mm -hmm. and then later on he learns that actually his dad never loved burnt toast that he just didn't want to be wasteful and the boy felt like this was such a a shock like that now he doesn't know anything about his father (laughs) because of this burnt toast did that have any significance to you that that, well, that that's actually be... where I thought about the whole "You Are My Sunshine" thing. Oh, really? actually. Yeah. <laughs> I, I but also I just thought, I mean, that father, like the whole scene, yeah, in when he tries to drown the the young boy in yeah. the bathtub, like 
that would be like that is the 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 more disturbing right. memory you would think for this child rather than the burnt, burnt toast. toast but yeah no that, what's a bit that more palatable to sort of remember is the burnt toast and then to maybe transfer some of those yeah emotions it's to that memory yeah i think it definitely represents that moment when you're a kid and you realize that your parents aren't perfect and that they're fallible and that they don't know everything going back to what we talked about yeah. earlier and that you know we're all just children on the inside trying to <laughs> muddle our way through Figure the world things out <laughs> And, uh, you know, I'm sure that we all have our own versions of burnt toast where we just do stuff just because it's the right thing to do or, you know, the not wasteful thing to do that that we pretend like we're we're virtuous in doing it. But really, we don't enjoy it like recycling. (laughs) I mean, it's good. It's important that we do it. But man, is it annoying that I can't just throw my recycling in the garbage chute and be done with it. I have to carry it all the way downstairs. We were talking about don't be a lazy reader earlier. Well, yeah. don't be a lazy <laughs> recycler, <laughs> Alan. <laughs> so did you have any, like, like did you um, relate it all to sort of the childhood memory kind of portion of the of the book? And did that make you think of anything for yourself? Yeah. Or it I mean, not to get me, too personal. Yeah, no, it made me feel old <laughs> you're young on the inside though. i'm young on the inside no it just made me realize like how long ago my my childhood is and and one of the things that i think about sometimes is you know i have these memories my earliest childhood memories uh, that i've had forever you know like throwing my sister's wooden toy car off the dock and having her try and chase after it she survived <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I must have had more memories of a child when I was closer to being a child. And now there just seem to be fewer and fewer than there were. And you just never know when those memories disappear. Like, when is this going to be the last time I'm ever going to have this memory of Hmm. being a childhood? And, you know, you have, I think this ties into, I'm a, not a hoarder, but like I collect things and, and part of it is like holding on to these things because these things will trigger memory. Right. And then if I get rid of them, then maybe I'll never trigger that memory again. Right. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did find reading this book, like I said before, too, that it did trigger some memories for me. Like I know um, I hadn't thought about some of the babysitters we had when I was young. Oh, right. And I hadn't thought about them in a while. Like we used yeah. to have a babysitter. So I was like maybe four and she would come and um, she would take lit matches and then put them in her mouth to <laughs> like to, to, to make them go out. Oh, yeah. And I was like four and I was like, I was horrified <laughs> because fire and matches. And I just, yeah. I like, I have this memory now in, in my head. It's like burned in there, so to speak. And I hadn't thought about it in a long, long time. And, you know, all dark. And then there she is with her, this lit match going right into her mouth. And then I had another babysitter, maybe two years later. And what she was into was making herself faint. So oh. she would stand... <laughs> By a, by a couch, and she would, like, hold her arms up around her neck and, like, cut off the oxygen. Wow. I don't know. And, and did she actually faint? Yes. <laughs> yes. She fainted. I was, like, six or seven. She hit her head on the wall. Her her um, contact lenses went up into her. Anyway, I, I dealt with it. It's okay. You, but still, like, tr- traumatic. You, you, you had a ter- terrifying babysitter. I know. Whereas right. me and my sister, I think, terrified our, our babysitter. Babysitters. We... we were so bad one time we forced the babysitter to lock themselves in the bathroom until my mom came home oh <laughs> dreadful children yeah. yeah i think we were screaming because we wanted another piece of pie or something like that and she was like no Burnt toast for you <laughs> yeah <laughs> So we do have one more uh, reader comment who wrote in and she was like, uh, this is from Jess from Fort Gary. And she said, why is the ending so sad? Mm. This ending should be happy. Um, You know, it's a novel that celebrates the wonder of being a child and makes statements that we should always be a child. But that's not the way it ends. It makes you, it's about letting go of being a childhood almost in some sense because the narrator forgets his story forgets who letty is and goes on with his life 
just looking at you makes you makes me think you you're gonna cry. Because like you can like really read my face today, yeah. um, Alan. Um, I kind of like that it sort of showed some of the unpleasantness of childhood. You know, childhood yeah. isn't always peachy keen. Probably for most people, oh, there's yeah. always loneliness and there's always like we forget what growing that growing up is a is a traumatic process yeah yeah and um and i guess maybe then can resonate Mm -hmm. for adults reading this although yeah i guess it is i don't know if i really saw it as a sad ending though i totally saw it as a sad ending Mm -hmm. so letty and i'm gonna do quotes here didn't die because she was absorbed by the ocean and the ocean would spit her back she's gonna come back right but then the fact that you know, he, um, the narrator comes back and he's like a middle-aged adult and he like, you know, relives this whole story again and Letty's still not back. It's like, Letty's never going to come back for him. He's that, Letty's, Letty's gone. Letty, as far as he's concerned, Letty's dead. Look, old granny Hempstock, yeah. she witnessed the Big Bang, okay? Yeah. So, you know, like, I think we can give, uh, we can give Letty more than, you know, 40 years to, or 35 years to come back. Yeah, right, exactly. You know, she'll come back, but not for, not for the narrator's perspective. No, that's he, right. He's just always going to have this little lost friend in Australia who's like not actually in Australia. (laughs) (laughs) That's life, little boy narrator. (laughs) (laughs) So let's go into our new segment from last time called Read Alike's Roundtable. Although when I was re-listening to the old uh, or the old, the last episode, I, there was a line from Tr- Trevor that I thought might make a better, better, um, name for this segment called, can you tell me a book you would also like? <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was a great way of, of, of phrasing it. So let's jump back across the pond and, and see what Erica has to say. My read-alike is really not so much a read-alike maybe as the book I was most reminded of. When I was reading, and that book is A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Langle. They both have kids facing these unimaginable powers on their own and their parents being kind of distant. They live out in nature um, and they're being spirited from place to place. And then especially when old Mrs. Hemstock was talking about electron decay and germs, it really reminded me of Mrs. What's It? and the hidden um, powers of the universe there. So the the one that I would recommend if you like this book is Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Langle. That's a a good good one from uh, Erica. Because I think, uh, especially right now, lots of of adults are rereading that book as well. So, and reading it to their kids. I wonder why that is. Hmm. Oprah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I've never read A Wrinkle in Time. So. I, long, long time ago. Do you ever read a like Kirsten? I do. What was it that Trevor said again? Uh, book that... Can you tell me a book you would also like? I should have asked yeah, that question. Yeah. I can tell you a book that you might also like. It's called Hideous Kinky by Esther Freud. Okay. Like Trevor did last time, I've brought the book as a as a visual prop for this audio podcast. <laughs> So I chose this because like Ocean um, at the end of the lane, it's it's a nice short book and it has a child narrator, which is a fairly rare thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, The story is about this child, also um, unnamed, her sister and her well-meaning mother who go to Morocco in the 1960s. Her mother is in pursuit of spiritual enlightenment. Narrator is about five or six. She does love words and uses words often in a way that probably you wouldn't really hear a five-year-old use. Um, So she does sometimes sound older than she is. Um, So for instance, uh, the title Hideous Kinky. Hideous Kinky are two words that she and her sister learn and they become sort of this childish chant for them, which is sort of like... There was a part in Ocean at the end of the lane where they talk about the language of shaping 
too. So that kind of made me think Mm -hmm. of that as well. Anyway, the whole story is told through her eyes, her ears, her perceptions. So you see Morocco, Marrakesh um, as this land of enchantment and magic. So there's lots of this really vibrant sensory depictions. Um, So you get the sights, the smells, but also the sense of danger and adventure. Um, And it's told in this sort of timeless zone of childhood where the information is shared to the reader, just like ocean at the end of the, of the lane, but often without even explanation or interpretation. So you can't be a lazy reader with this one either. It, it is sort of up to the reader to kind of construct some of the story for themselves. Yeah. And it just, you, you end up looking at childhood in, in a bit of different light. Um, childhood, yes, full of adventure and magic, but it's also very, very real because this is definitely not like a happy go lucky childhood tale, but that's my suggestion. Hideous Kinky by Esther Freud. Esther Freud. Wow. So my suggestion for a book that uh, you would also like is called The Uses of Enchantment, The Meaning and Importance of Fairy Tales. Ah. And this is by Bruno Bettelheim. It's from the 1970s, uh, and it's a Freudian analysis of fairy tales. So we were talking about the importance of story. This book analyzes fairy tales and how children can learn from them and use these fairy tales to assist with existential conflict. So things like separation anxiety, anxiety, Oedipal conflict, sibling ri- rivalry. These are all themes in, in fairy tales, you know, that are, are he frames of them as being more digestible ways to deal with these issues than their full complexity. So they're simplified down into stories. So very good. Mm-hmm. Good suggestion. And, and it is funny because Esther Freud is like great, great granddaughter of what? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and like the daughter, I think of Lucian Freud, the artist. So yeah. So it all very all, interesting. Very, we did not plan that. We did not plan it. No. Awesome. Sweet. <laughs> Before we leave the ocean at the end of the lane, did you have any final comments about about the book? I did just uh, take out uh, one of his latest uh, book of short stories. I think I like his his shorter shorter book so i'm I, I he certainly has turned me on to to more reading of his so that that was my next question would you read another neil gaiman book so <laughs> which, certain john cer- certain, certain ones of his. yeah i think i might try and read american gods again because i hear the tv show is really good uh although they switch showrunners or something so it's some different cast or a lot of differences so we'll mm. see if the second season gets as good as the reviews as the first season uh but now it's on to nerd word for word nerds it's the part of the show where each of our hosts pick a word defines it and then explains why it has been tickling their tongue for the past month uh so we're gonna jump back across the pond and let erica start us off i have in my hands a yorkshire english dictionary that tells me that it was in Yorkshire, as well as Lincolnshire, Staffordshire, and Derbyshire, that Anglo-Saxon speakers mixed with Scandinavian settlers in markets and stuff in the 8th to 11th centuries that developed the simplified speech that resulted in the simplified Anglo-Saxon Middle English that uh, became the world language English that we are familiar with now. So I have been learning these Yorkshire words that are sort of a mixture of more common English and Scots. And the one that I would like to bring to your attention is chelp. And chelp is to talk loudly. And the example is, stop the bairn chelpin. This ear's a library. Please keep your child quiet. We are in a library. And if you've been in one of our libraries, you know they're very rarely quiet. The other one, if I could have a bonus one, is Bob. And I'm not going to pronounce everything correctly here either, but Bob is an old shilling, or to depart for a short time, or to punch. And all three, um, according to this dictionary, all three are used in this ditty about two ex-friends called Robert. If thar bob doesn't get our bob, to bob that thar bob owes our bob, then our bob will bob around thar bobs and give thar bob a bob on to nose. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> 
Bob's such a good word, eh? It has <laughs> such a good mouthfeel. Yeah, really. <laughs> that, that's funny, too, that she uh, had the chilp um, just and then related it to the libraries. Because, again, feral children in libraries. Yes, yeah. very good. <laughs> Um, and I'll go, I'll go next and then I'll fire it off to you. Uh, my word is wubba lubba dub dub. What? <laughs> I think we have to choose real words. No, it is a real word. Oh. Uh, it's a colloquial, it's a colloquialism in native bird person language. Uh, and it means I'm in great pain. Please help me. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so for those of you do, who don't know where uh, bird person language comes from, uh, it's a race in uh, Rick and Morty. Uh, there's a race of bird people. And uh, Rick, who's this uh, time-traveling, uh, dimension-traveling scientist, has a catchphrase called uh, Wubba Lubba Dub Dub. And he says it with great enthusiasm uh, all the time. And then you find out that its translation is, I am in great pain, please help me, which <laughs> is which is such a, a deep emotional punch in that series because Rick is just this uh, cocky, uh, I know everything, I have everything all figured out. And to, to hear him say, I'm in great pain, please help me. And then to transfer that back throughout the, the rest of the, uh, the season is... is uh, an heart example wrenching. heart wrenching it is it is one of the best shows on tv if you don't watch rick and morty i'm bringing this up because the third season gets released on blu-ray next month uh the library has seasons one on one and two uh on dvd so you can check them out if you haven't already and re-watch them again the dvds have audio commentary on each episode which is great uh if you're like me and just can't wait for the for the next season to come out something to to help hold you over so wubba lubba dub dub wubba lubba dub dub um well my uh nerd word is saunter so um in the next week i'm actually going to saunter out of here i'm going to go for a a long walk uh in portugal and into spain a 250 kilometer walk it's a historic pilgrimage to Santiago so this isn't my first Camino is what it's called but uh, I did the longer one the 750 kilometer one uh, a few years ago so the 250 kilometers no, there'll be nothing it'll be more like a saunter <laughs> um, so the dictionary meaning <clears throat> is saunter is leisurely stroll or to walk in a slow relaxed manner without hurry or effort now, 250 kilometers is still 250 kilometers. So I, I, um, I gleaned a different uh, meaning and definition of the word from Henry David Thoreau's essay on walking, which was published in the Atlantic magazine back in May 1862. In it, he describes how the word saunter comes from the Middle Ages when people went on pilgrimages uh, to the Holy Land and they passed through villages along the way. And when they were asked where they were going, they said, à la santerre, to the Holy Land. And so they became known as santerres or saunters. Oh, nice. <laughs> But then Thoreau also proposes another definition or origin of the word, saying that it comes from the French sans terre, or without land, without a home. So therefore, when walking or sauntering, um, and certainly this happens when you're on the Camino, uh, you are being equally at home everywhere. So saunter. That's awesome. Uh, and if you're interested in what the Atlantic magazine has these days, we have it at the library, both in physical and digital form. <laughs> so, But I will also put a link to the 1862 article on walking by Henry David Thoreau on uh, the show notes. And I will, it exists. I will read it uh, on, the sh on the show <laughs> notes, uh, which can be found, uh, if you're not aware of the website, it's wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca, uh, where you'll find our show notes. Uh, so thank you so much, dear readers, for joining us on the quaternary voyage of the mm -hmm. Time to Read podcast. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we have. I can officially reveal our next book, which is Eleanor and Park by Rainbow Rowell. I'm really excited to talk Yay. about this one. I'm really excited about the read I like said that I have planned for this one. So find it at your local Winnipeg Public Library branch, or if you don't live in Winnipeg, your local public library branch. And join the discussion on our website, wpl-podcast.com 
www.winnipeg.ca uh, or by emailing us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca. Uh, remember to rate us on iTunes. And until next time, make sure you all find time, time to, to read. read. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Time to Read. We were discussing The Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman. Time to Read is a production of the Winnipeg Public Library. Your hosts today were Alan Shorney and Kirsten Werman. Erica Ball phoned it in from across the Atlantic. Trevor Lockhart couldn't make it today, but will be back. Our webmaster is Aaron Seaburn. Our social media guru is Regan Brew. Audio production and music by Dennis Penner. Some of our comments and questions today come from Andrea from Henderson and Jess from Fort Gary. We want you to be part of the show, too. Email us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca with suggestions for books that you'd like us to read and discuss, and comments and questions about the books we're reading for our next show. Visit us on the web at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. Check out our show notes with links to some of the things we talked about today, and take part in a discussion about the books we're reading. Next month, we're reading Eleanor and Park by Rainbow Rowell. We're looking forward to hearing what you think. 